Welcome to Radical Feminist Perspectives. Today we are going to hear about Harriet, the writings and work of Harriet Taylor Mill, and we're hearing from Kate Newey. So thank you so much, Kate, and over to you. Oh, thank you very much, Joe, and it's a real pleasure to um, address this webinar. I, I've participated in it so many times, so I'm slightly nervous. But anyway, um, so this is Harriet Taylor Mill. And one of the really interesting things about her is the names we use for her. Um, she was born in 1807 as Harriet Harvey. She was married to her first husband, John Taylor, in 1826. She was just 19 and he was 30. Um, and then she married um, the probably very much more famous um, English philosopher and writer, John Stuart Mill, in 1851. Um, she died in 1858 in Avignon, where she's buried, and you can still see the graveyard. I haven't yet made the journey to see that. Um, she uh, had a, a, a fairly um, ordinary, as it were, a childhood. Um, her mother had seven children. Harriet was the middle child, but that was quite normal at the time. And interestingly, Harriet only had three children. Um, Harriet was the middle child, and as was normal for daughters of middle-class families. Um, she was educated at home and then married quite young uh, to John Taylor, um, who was 30. Uh, and that, that, that age difference might be significant in her later life. Although she was the daughter uh, or the sibling of one of seven children, um, Harriet only had three children with John Taylor her two sons and then her daughter born in 1831 just after she met John Stuart Mill um, and uh, Helen um, goes on to be a very interesting uh, woman in her own right and worth um, thinking and following up as well. The interesting thing also about the Taylors was that they were Unitarians and part of that North London radical free thinking congregation. Um, and Unitarians didn't believe in the Trinity of um, God, uh, the Father, Son and Holy Ghost. For example, they thought Jesus Christ was just a very good man and a um, a symbol or a, a, a model for, for following in, in one's life. Um, really, uh, like the Quakers, very involved in 19th century, particularly Victorian reformist movements, um, such as anti-slavery and so on. <clears throat> so Harriet Taylor Mill um, started writing uh, pretty much when she met John Stuart Mill, and they had this very long friendship, shall we say, which um, they kept the um, respectable side of scandal, but only just. Um, and it's long been a discussion uh, in uh, Mill, um, Mill scholarship and uh, to a certain extent feminist scholarship about how we should regard that relationship. I'm going to say a little bit about that in a minute. Um, she wrote um, articles for the Monthly Repository, and then her major essay, which I'm going to start talking about, um, was published under John Stuart Mill's name after her death in the Westminster Review, which was a major serious um, uh, publication full of Mill edited for a long time, um, full of a lot of the most um, in, radical in in the 19th century way, radical writing and thinking. Uh, one of Harriet, Harriet Taylor Mill's biographers in a book just published this year notes that there were probably a lot more unpublished pieces. And she argues that Mill's outline of the co-authorship of all his work, he argues that he co-authored all of his major works with Harriet Taylor, um, this is often seen as a complete overstatement of a man who was desperately in love and then desperately bereaved after Harriet's death. Um, Helen McCabe argues that actually the kind of writing she's doing um, uh, means that that statement by John Stuart Mill is not an overstatement um, in the way that many historians and philosophers have argued it, it is. Um, so this is what another... Um, a scholar who works on Harriet Taylor Mill and has put together, um, I've got the volume here, a thick volume, 
of Harriet Taylor's complete works, which it also includes 250 pages of her letters to various people in her life, which are fascinating to read. Um, Jacobs writes together, Harriet Taylor Mill and John Stuart Mill developed an integrated writing process with each individual contribution based upon his or her strengths. Harriet's broad vision, her initiation of a line of argument, her general view form the clay that John refines into written texts. That these two parts of writing might find their home in not one, but in two souls seems obvious to those who've experienced it and impossible to those who have not. And there were many people in the um, in writing about John Stuart Mill who don't believe that. And I want to show you today why we might indeed think that Harriet Taylor was embedded in John Stuart Mill's thinking and writing. Here's a little bit about Helen Taylor. Uh, she was a suffrage campaigner. She collaborated with and co-edited with her stepfather um, and posthumously published several of his essays, including some really interesting essays on religion. He was a lifelong atheist, um, but he actually, towards the end of his life, does start thinking about religious belief. Um, and he dies in the 1870s, and it's when people like William James are also starting to think about the nature of religious belief. She also trained as an actress, which is really interesting, I think. It was one of the few professions that women could enter on pretty much equal status as men and often be paid more than men. The really famous actresses were often paid well in, in the realm of kind of stardom salaries. Um, she was active in local governance and she, I love this, Helen Taylor, this is Harriet Taylor Mill's daughter, John Stuart Mill's stepdaughter, attempted to stand for parliament as a candidate in Camberwell. And you can see there the list, um, of uh, this is taken from the Dictionary of National Biography, the list of her campaign claims, her campaigning um, ticket. Uh, as you can see, some of those things we still might quite like to have. Um, the, uh, uh, the returning officer refused to accept her nomination. Uh, but the fact that she was also elected in public elections for the local school board and many women in the later part of the 19th century became politically active through these smaller, more local, local government kind of um, organizations such as school boards. So they were starting to get a lot of experience as um, governors, as leaders in, in those sort of public institutions. So this is what John Stuart Mill says about his work with Harriet Taylor Mill. All my published writings were as much her work as mine. Her share constantly increased as years advanced. When two peoples have their two persons have their thoughts and speculations in common, when all subjects of intellectual or moral interest are discussed between them in daily life and probed to much greater depth than are usually or conveniently sounded in writings intended for general readers. When they set out from them same principles and arrive at conclusions by processes pursued jointly, it is of little consequence in respect to the question of originality, which of them holds the pen. And Mill was really, I think, very. I'm a great fan of John Stuart Mill. Um, I think he was really genuine in what he says, but of course he's the man he knows he holds the pen. Um, you know, as Jane Austen says many years earlier, men have all the advantages, they've always held the pen. And this has led to quite a controversy throughout um, scholarship on John Stuart Mill and Harriet Taylor Mill. Much of the writing on Harriet Taylor Mill is, is directed towards showing how what Mill says here was accurate. And many um, historians and philosophers who work on John Stuart argue that in all things, he was very clear sighted, very accurate, very logical in all things, except this thing that he says in his autobiography, that Harriet Taylor um, was the, the complete co-author of um, most of his major works, uh, things like On Liberty, Utilitarianism, um, and uh, the really influential essay on the subjection of women. So what, what I'm going to look at now is um, uh, Harriet Taylor's essay, 
The Enfranchisement of Women, which was published just after her death, it was published under John Stuart Mill's name, um, but he explains in a little preface uh, that he didn't write it. Um, Alice Rossi, whose books, Essays on Sex Equality, was my first reading on this. This is my copy and it's got my name, 1978, when I first encountered this material as an undergraduate. Um, and um, she argues that the book is the uh, the turning point, the, the stands alone. I would actually say she forgets about Mary Wollstonecraft um, and Mary Wollstonecraft's book written in 1792, Vindications of the Rights of Women. Mary Wollstonecraft's work gets lost in the 19th century publicly, partly because she lived with William Godwin without marriage until he married her to make Mary Shelley uh, legitimate. And although many women, um, Barbara Kane, the historian in Australia, has written about this a lot, although many women read Mary Wollstonecraft's book, A Vindication of the Rights of Woman, they couldn't afford to talk about her in public because she was seen as this um, illegitimate woman. Um, we're recovering, and ever since the 1970s, I think these these fun, foundational texts for our movement have been recovered, as Virginia Woolf says. You know, we think back through our mothers. Um, so, so the enfranchisement of women starts as a report on the 1850 Ohio Convention of Women, and um, Taylor Mill. I'll just probably call her Harriet from now on, even though that kind of scholarly thing would be to call her Taylor Mill, but Harriet is easier. Um, starts with this outline of the demands of this convention of women and starts to present the USA as a place where um, these claims for equality and particularly for suffrage um, are founded in the Constitution of the United States. And what I love about the way Harriet and John Stuart Mill think in all of this is that they're very, very logical and they throw the logic of things like the American Constitution in the face of people who gainsay these equalities for women. And she quotes in the essay, she quotes the pre preamble to the American Constitution. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. She then goes on to say that it is fitting that men whose names will remain associated with the extirpation, extirpation sorry, from the democratic soil of America of the aristocracy of color will be among the originators for the first collective process against the aristocracy of sex. That is, and, and this, this um, entwining of the principles of opposition to enslavement and the principles of opposition to the inequality of women against men, the entwining of those two principles uh, continues through the enfranchisement of women and is really, um, uh, present in the first couple of chapters, particularly the first chapter of The Subjection of Women, the, the major essay that Taylor Mill and Mill write together. Um, and I think give rise to the famous statement that Emmeline Pankhurst makes, I would rather be a rebel, rebel than a slave. Now there's a lot of subsequent, particularly post um, Black Lives Matter movement and Kimberly Crenshaw's work on the intersection of sex and race for um, particularly African-American women, um, you know, uh, feminists. Um, there's been a picking apart of this narrative, but I think at this point in British history, it's a really important narrative that if you're in a country that has um, <clears throat> uh, supposedly in 1833, gotten rid of the enslavement of peoples throughout the British Empire, um, if you're in a country that, you know, the, the mill workers in Manchester supported the um, 
the North against the South in the Civil War in, in the 1860s in the United States, then um, this does become, I think, quite a powerful argument. So after giving us a brief introduction to this Ohio Convention, Harriet moves her focus to Britain and makes another comparison to Chartism. Now, by 1851, Chartism, which was a movement of male workers for the Charter, the six points of the Charter, and I can, I always forget what they are, but one of them includes universal suffrage. It also includes um, the secret ballot, uh, yearly parliaments, the payment of members of parliament. Now, a number of those we have now. We have the secret ballot. We have the payment for members of parliament. We don't have yearly parliaments. We do ha now have universal male and female suffrage. The Chartists asked only for universal male suffrage. Um, but they didn't name it that way. They just said universal suffrage. And so again, what Harriet Taylor Mill does here is names the absence the Chartist who denies the suffrage to women is a Chartist only because he is not a lord. He is one of those levelers who would level only down to themselves. So she's saying there they're not really wanting universal suffrage. They only want what is good for them, you know. Um, and indeed, female, there were female Chartists and they had a really difficult time. And what she's pointing to in that word leveler as well is really interesting. I thought it should be capitalized with a with a, a capital L, but it's not. But I think it's also a reference to the levelers from the um, the English Revolution, the the Commonwealth in the middle of the 17th century under Cromwell, and the um, the huge outpouring then of um, uh, religious people who used a very um, kind of really ultra Protestant notion of religion to um, claim a republic and to claim workers' rights and claim people's rights that were all equal before God. Um, so I think that's a really interesting kind of further political reference that shows that she knows the history of um, radical thought, you know, that she's read and she's thought. She goes on to make a, um, oops, I'm having trouble getting, oh, here we are. She goes on to make a, a critique of blatant injustices and illogicalities. Um, and she talks about the axiom of English freedom that taxation and representation should be co coextensive. And I think that's an interesting uh, reference back to the opening of the essay, uh, which opens in America. And of course, we know that the 1776 um, war, American War of Independence from Britain was chiefly, it was supposedly about no taxation without representation. Um, she also talks about um, the current state of women under British law, and, and this becomes a real feature of um, one of the chapters of um, the, the later essay on the subjection of women. Uh, once a woman, woman gets married, she becomes um, literally her husband's property, and her property is her husband's property. But, but Taylor Mill, Harriet, points out that there are unmarried women who pay taxes. Um, and she also points out that there's a, it's a fundamental doctrine that we are tried by our peers, but women are tried by male judges and a male jury. So again, she's naming and she's opening out the fact that the universal language of judge and jury is not universal. It's sex-based and it excludes women. Um, this is really very radical for this period. You know, this is the period where um, a woman um, could only divorce her husband uh, through a, um, a, a, a bill of parliament if she was of a certain um, status. You know, if, if you were, if you were um, of the aristocracy and wanted to divorce your husband, it took a bill in the, enacted in parliament to do so. So 
um, the trapping of women, the uh, what what Mill and Taylor go on to talk about as the enslavement of women is is kind of legislated for. Now, one of the major features of the argument of the later essay, The Subjection of Women, which is published in 1868 or 1869, I always forget which year, um, is that the only reason we don't, one of the main reasons we don't have full equality of men and women under law is custom. And so Harriet Taylor, interestingly, starts to think about this in this earlier essay, and this is where I think the claim that Mill makes that the ideas in the subjection of women were worked out jointly between them, they're as much his as, they're as much her ideas as his ideas, starts to be made clear in these later pages of the essay. The essay is about 20 pages long, so it's quite a long, you know, journal article to be published, and this was the feature of the Westminster Review, they published these long form um, think pieces, I think we call them now. Um, so she talks about um, all the old culture, the old society in Britain was based on the rule of force. But she argues that in the 19th century, and she talks about it as the present and a progressive society, that no longer should we simply rely on the principle of force, that this is you know, um, she actually calls it a primitive um, uh, kind of primitive principle for the organization of society. And she says that um, in the past, you know, if you're weaker, you were legally inferior, but that now there's no need for that. We're beyond that. We're more progressive than that. Um, <laughs> there is a little bit of the sort of right side of history argument there, which um, we are all kind of grown at um, nowadays. But um, she's trying to make the case that we should think logically about us, the organisation of our society, rather than just relying on custom. And I think also this essay gives us one of the earliest critiques of sex-based stereotypes. Mary Wollstonecraft in A Vindication of the Rights of Women really describes sex-based stereotypes. She talks about the nature of women and the way that women are connected to the domestic and the child rearing and the family and so on. She doesn't quite get us to the point of questioning that those sex-based stereotypes. But Mill, uh, Harriet Taylor Mill, and then uh, in this essay and in the later essay, starts to talk about and make a critique of what in the 19th century were known as the separate spheres of men and women. John Ruskin talks about that, that women are, are in the domestic sphere and men are in the public sphere. And I think she gets quite angry. She says, we deny the right of any portion of the species to decide for another portion or any individual for another individual what is our, or what is not their proper sphere. And I can I, I don't know what she sounded like. I can just hear the, the kind of the, the anger and the contempt and the, the kind of desire to really argue against this. She goes on to say, the proper sphere for all human beings is the largest and highest which they are able to attain to. What this is cannot be ascertained without complete liberty of choice. And this is her argument. And this is the argument that is threaded throughout um, the later essay, The Subjection of Women. And I think these passages start to make the case uh, that has been denied for so long that Harriet Taylor was really the co-author of much of John Stuart Mill's work. Um, she also says, well, we don't know whether the proper sphere for women is just or only the domestic, because we haven't tried women out in other spheres, except she says, and this is the last line here, by a curious anomaly, whoops, sorry, went, I need to go backwards, by a curious anomaly, Though ineligible to even the lowest officers of state, they are in some countries admitted to the highest of all, the regal. And if there is any one function for which they have shown a decided vocation, it is that of reigning. And she's writing it at the time, of course, when 
and Britain is ruled by Queen Victoria. So there's a wonderful irony there that I think she's really reveling in. So um, she's making the argument that um, uh, the reasons for excluding women from active life um, are that um, she says there are three main reasons if you she's trying to read she's she's looking at the argument against women being in politics she says there are three main reasons the incompatibility of active life with maternity and with the cares of a household the alleged hardening effect on character and then thirdly the inexpediency of making an addition to the already excessive pressure of competition in every kind of professional or lucrative employment and then the rest of the essay really is going through demolishing those three reasons. She says, not all women are mothers. And even if they are mothers, does that mean that they are not fit for public life as well? Just because you do one job doesn't mean you can't do another job. Um, she also says uh, that if public life is going to corrupt women, it's going to corrupt men as well. And she also says, well, competition, competition is a good thing. It means the best rises to the top. Um, now, you know, we, we have subsequent to um, Taylor Miller Mill's work on liberty and uh, liberalism, we, we've come to sort of question that version of competition. But I think as a, as a tool against the situation in which she finds herself in the 1850s against the kind of customary oh well women have never had the vote so they can't have it because they've never had it you know this sort of circular argument I think the idea of open free competition where everyone starts on a level playing field is a really powerful idea at this time we've come subsequently to to make a critique of that I mean the interesting thing about this whole issue and there's not time to go into uh, the critique of liberalism, but the interesting thing about this in terms of Mill, uh, in terms of Taylor Mill and uh, Harriet and John Stuart Mill, is that they both thought of themselves as socialists, that not Marxists, but because this is pre-Marx, but socialists in that they thought, I mean, Mill, they, they talk about the freedom from and the freedom to, and they argue that you can't be free to do certain things until you're free from certain things, until you're free from enslavement, until you're free from poverty, until you're free from um, starvation. And so the argument for female liberty is part of this larger argument for um, liberating all of humankind from corruption and restraints and allowing them to become the best people they can be. So, um, part of Taylor Mill's argument then is, is to critique um, uh, conditioning, socialization, to critique customary ways of thinking about women, to really turn the logic of the, the naysayers, of the anti-feminists, the anti-women, against themselves and say, well, um, if you are totally logical about these things, then here, here's the logic, you know, um, that applies to men as it applies to women. Um, so I'm going to go on to the subjection of women, but I wonder if it's worth just pausing a bit to see if there are any questions picked up so far that that I might, that if stuff's not clear, I'm racing through this, I'm so sorry. It's, it's such rich material. Um, whether this, I'll just in the chat. Um, yeah, oh, there's a, there's a, there's a lot. <laughs> I'm not sure if there are one or two questions that I could um, uh, sort of attend to um, briefly, or shall I just keep going? Oh, yeah, just the one that's just come up from Dorothea Mill as a liberal rather than a socialist. That's, I think, the way we would see him today. The way that he actually talks about himself is as a socialist. And I think we have to remember that this is pre-Marx and that there's a huge socialist movement in France at the beginning of the 19th century the, uh, in the, the post-French Revolution. Mill was really interested in the work of Auguste Comte and um, uh, Saint-Simon, who was a little bit like um, uh, 
various people who set up um, kind of millenarian uh, communal communities in Britain at about the same time. I'm trying to think of the guy uh, who set up a model. There are people who set up model villages and kind of these industrial um, communal modern villages and so on. not so much the Cadbury's or Saltaire but people who did it from the workers point of view so it's a really tricky one um, you know there's probably too long to go on but Mill himself in many of his writings calls himself a socialist and I think again that is probably the influence of Harriet Taylor um, and it's about this freedom from poverty it's about using the the principle of utility the greatest good for the greatest number of people to say okay so that works for economics as well as for um, other things so you know you could argue a socialist sharing of resources from from that and I think that's what Mill was really interested in um, he's not that you know neither of them is perfect um, but anyway so this is the opening sentence of the essay, The Subjection of Women. Um, and this is published after John Stuart Mill dies. I would make the argument as we work through it that it is drawn from much of the work that he does with Harriet Taylor, as we can see um, how in her earlier essay, The Enfranchisement of Women, um, she is trying to unpick the current situation of women in a very logical um, way. They're working now, you have to say, it, I know this is a seminar for radical feminism. Harriet and John are working within the structures, the kind of institutional governance structures of society in the middle of the 19th century. And, you know, the, but the fact that, for example, John Stuart Mill as a young man, and this is before he meets Harriet Taylor, is interested in the work of these French communal um, philosophers, philosophers like Comte and Saint-Simon, who are interested in a kind of um, organization of society around communal goods and uh, communal principles, I think suggests that he's always ready, you know, that both of them are ready to think beyond the institutions and the very fact of their friendship that they reluctantly turn into marriage. Mill, uh, John Stuart Mill of his own writes on his own a letter to Harriet Taylor outlining all his objections to marrying her and it's not about her it's about the institution of marriage. So I, I'm kind of here flying the flag for both of them as thinking outside their society to a certain extent, but also trying to work with the principles and logics of the people that they're trying to persuade. Um, you know, it's quite a useful strategy perhaps um, for people who want to make change. Anyway, um, uh, you know, we can talk about this in the breakout room. <laughs> uh, um, the opening sentence of the subjection of women, I think, is a really powerful sentence, but it's a very long and uh, arduous sentence. And um, they say at the beginning, and the, the, the whole essay is written in the first person, uh, but I will use they, and I'm not being non-binary here, I'm talking about Harriet and John together. Um, they say, the very words necessary to express the task I have undertaken show how arduous it is. Um, you know, and I think we still sometimes find that when we're in arguments ourselves. Um, one of the really interesting things that they set out at the beginning, I'm going to focus, it's four chapters. I'm going to focus on the first two, really, because I think I'm going to run out of time at that point. Um, uh, they talk about feelings. And I pulled this out because I thought that actually this is partly what we're facing today in um, countering with logic and science, <laughs> countering gender extremist ideology of transactivism, that um, we're always countering, oh, but my feelings are hurt, oh, but I'm offended. Um, and they argue that um, if something is based on feeling, 
it loses in power of a kind of logical argument. Because they say the adoption of this system of inequality never was the result of deliberation or forethought. And they go on to say, you know, if we had tried the experiment where we tried a society which was run by men, and we tried a society which is run by women, and we come to the conclusion that neither of them worked and we need, you know, they, they say, we haven't experimented this with this. We don't know for sure through logic and empirical testing that this is the best way we can organize the world. And I mean, <laughs> I love these arguments partly for their power, but also the certain naivety that, you know, these arguments, these political arguments, these radical political arguments can be dealt with simply through logic. And I think, you know, we bang our heads against this wall today still. Um, and somehow I kind of take strength from reading this material um, that, we can still muster these powerful logical arguments. Um, so again, this is where, this is a passage where I think uh, they're drawing on Harriet Taylor's earlier essay about how in the past, uh, British society was organized around force. Um, and, um, that might have been the case. Uh, and then the, the second paragraph on this slide, I'm going to read it. Sorry, I'm racing through this material. I'm happy to email these slides to people afterwards or post them somewhere if, if they're useful to people. But I want to read out this final paragraph here. All causes, social and natural, combine to make it unlikely that women should be collectively rebellious to the power of men. They are so far in a position different from all other subject classes that their masters require something more from them than actual service. Men do not want solely the obedience of women. They want their sentiments. All men, except the most brutish, desire to have in the woman most nearly connected with them, not a forced slave, but a willing one, not a slave merely, but a favorite. And I think that final sentence is really key. Um, it's just there in the first chapter of the essay, but I think that it starts to, again, identify and name the kind of socialization and conditioning of women into heteronormativity, into heterosexual marriage, and it brings forth the major argument they have about the difference between enslaved people and women. And I think I'm, I'm a little tentative about bringing forward this argument because I think post Kimberly Crenshaw and so on, there's a lot of a critique to make of it, but I'm just going to present it. And, you know, with all the usual, this is situated, I'm situated where I, we're all where we are. Because this is where they start to talk about the difference between the enslavement of peoples that they, you know, that were seen across the British Empire and in Africa and in the United States, you know, in, in a way, the British Empire and the United States, there's always been enslavement of peoples, um, but uh, the the, the Anglo-American world in the 19th century, as, as historians have said, really turned enslavement into an industrial model. Okay, so all of that said, this is where we, this is the passage where we start to get the comparison between women and enslaved people. And I think what they're really trying to do here is not so, is not so much say, um, the enslavement of women is worse than the enslavement of people of color. I think what, I mean, although you could read it that way, to be honest, you could read it that way, right? The enslavement of white women is worse than the enslavement of black men. Um, and I think people have read it that way in the past, but I think what they're trying to say is if we are in a progressive society that by this point, there's been the abolition of slavery across the British Empire. There's been the abolition of enslavement. You know, there's been a war fought about the principle, the economic principles of enslavement in the United States of America. If we've seen these things happen, 
in the last 50 years, why do we still rest easily and accept a very similar situation for women in our own country? Um, so I think that's the way I would read this. And there are still caveats about that. Um, but I think they, they put the argument very bluntly. And again, as Harriet Taylor does in her earlier essay, she names the problem. Um, and um, I, I think that naming the issue, naming the deficit, naming the advantage men have and the disadvantage women have is um, absolutely crucial. And it's what we're still fighting. Um, I work partly, I'm, I'm an historian by training, but I, I work in a drama department and teach English literature, right, at a university, a hugely captured university, but I still teach this material, so we're not all captured. And one of the things that happened with literary criticism in the 1980s was this phrase, the death of the author. And there's a wonderful feminist scholar who says, well, we need to know what women wrote. You know, before we bury the author, let's name the bodies. And I think this is still happening to us today. Women have just started to be able to name our situation. And we now find in this very moment, we're not allowed to use the term woman. The NHS tries to get rid of the, you know, so I won't go off on that com contemporary rant, but I think that, that these tools we have in the history give us some powerful kind of models and tools for the kind of battles we're facing today. Um, and I teach this material to about 25 female students a year and get them into realizing this material. Um, and hopefully that is making a small change um, in little steps. Um, OK, so again, one of the things they start to do in chapter one is unpick the, po the, the position of women. Um, and um, they talk about the ways in which um, women are pushing for the suffrage, pushing for equal representation. Um, and you can see here directly, I would say this is a paragraph written directly by Harriet. Um, it comes back to the American situation. She never traveled to America, but she was very interested in it. So this is the first chapter. And um, uh, this is the um, uh, final part of the first chapter. I'm going for time. Right. Yeah, I've got about 10 minutes left. Right. So this is the final bit of the first chapter. And um, it's where I think Taylor and Mill start to analyze sex-based stereotypes. And they start to say that um, it is women are formed um, by their conditions. Yeah, so we're very familiar. We, we talk about this now as social constructionism, about socialization, about conditioning. When in my consciousness raising group in the 70s, we talked about conditioning. Um, here you are, the final sentence of this long paragraph, and I realize there's a lot of text to wade through. It may be asserted without scruple that no other class of dependents have had their character so entirely distorted from its natural proportions by their relation with their masters. I'll just pause there to note the word master. They're very deliberately using the language of enslavement to talk about men. For if conquered and slave races have been in some respects more forcibly repressed, whatever in them has not been crushed down by an iron heel has generally been left alone. And if left with any liberty of development, it has developed itself according to its own laws. That is, that even conquered and slave races have been given some, some liberty, some liberty of development, and that has allowed them to carry on, right? But in the case of women, a hot house and stove cultivation, the way young women are brought up, has always been carried on of some of the capabilities of their nation, na nature for the benefit and pleasure of their masters. So women's so-called natural propensities for certain things have been developed for the benefit and pleasure of their masters, i.e. men, their fathers, their husbands, you know. Um, so that's the end of the first chapter. I probably got time just to talk a little bit about what they go through into the second chapter. The third chapter is about women's education. 
and makes an argument for, again, this kind of logical argument for the full education of women, for the progress and greater good of the whole society. And they do pull out the argument, if women are mothers, then we need educated mothers. You know, that's one of their powerful arguments. And we might look askance at that argument nowadays, although I still think it's a pretty good argument. Um, uh, although we don't educate women simply for motherhood now, but you know, they're using the tools of their time to persuade the people of their time. Um, the fourth chapter is about opening up the professions for women. And this is where you start to see, it's an essay that comes from their own experience as soundly grounded in the middle class. Um, and so, uh, and Helen Taylor, I think, carries this on with her work as a, a suffrage supporter. Um, uh, she's grounded in the institutions of the middle class, of the professions, of law, of medicine, of teaching, those really stalwart um, sort of central professions of the Victorian middle class. So the second chapter so this is the final, what we've, I've still got on the screen is the final paragraph of the first chapter. So the second chapter talks about the conditions of marriage. And I might leave you with some of these and then we can talk about it later. Um, but really in the 19th century, um, women were what was known as femme, femme couverte, the covered woman. The husband and wife were one person in law. And what Taylor and Mill do is they systematically refute the logic and morality of the way that women treats marriage as uh, that marriage, sorry, treats women as property. And I give this chapter to my second year students um, in a course on women in theatre to explain why women's plays are all about marriage. And I say, well, marriage was one of the most important economic decisions a woman could make at this point. And one young woman who was, I think, I mean, she identified herself as an evangelical Christian very early on. And she just read this chapter and she said, oh, if this is what marriage is, I'm surprised the species survived. You know, her eyes were well and truly opened. And I love it when I teach undergraduates and the penny drops uh, with giving them this historical material. Anyway, um, so I'm going to jump and this will be my last slide, I think. I'm probably um, coming to time. Is that right, Jo? Um, you've, got, you've got about 10 minutes left, so. Oh, great. Oh, lovely. Okay. All right, well, I'll go to the previous slide. Right, so this is chapter two. The two are called one person in law for the purpose of inferring that whatever is hers is his, but the parallel inference is never drawn that whatever is his is hers. And I love the way that they just turn the logic around you know, and just say, okay, you say what is hers is his. And this is why so many, if you watch, you know, bodice ripping kind of adaptations of 19th century novels on television or read 19th century novels, there's so much fuss about marriage settlements and so on. These marriage settlements were basically to preserve a woman's property, anything she brought into the marriage and wanted to leave as she pleased to her children. If her father did not make a legal agreement with her husband-to-be, she would lose any right to private property on marriage. And I have um, I remember once um, I used to give talks to the Jane Austen Society, and once um, uh, we had an accountant, an historical accountant, who was also a, a sort of really interested in history of this, and he said, it is doubtful whether, whether in the 19th century, a married woman could sign a check on her own behalf. So this is kind of Handmaid's Tale stuff. You know, when M Margaret Atwood starts that novel with all women's bank accounts are blocked and all their money goes to their husbands. This was the way that women lived in the 19th century. And I think Margaret Atwood said, there's nothing in that novel that hasn't happened anywhere in the world at some point. Um, so I love the way that um, they turn the maxim that, you know, what is his is never hers, right? And they also talk about the ways in which um, uh, um, women are treated. And again, the comparison with enslavement is here and it's, it's problematic, but it's, um, 
it makes the point no slave is a slave to the same lengths and in so full a sense of the word as a wife is hardly any slave except one immediately attached to the master's person is a slave at all hours and all minutes in general he has like a soldier his fixed task and when it is done or when he is off duty he disposes within certain limits of his own time and have a family life into which the master rarely intrudes now we know that really isn't true and I think what they're talking about here is actually the fact that once a woman is married her body is her husband's you know there is no such concept as rape in marriage um, and I think they're saying well you know um, uh, enslaved peoples could have their own family life and we know that that's not true we know that female um, women who are enslaved were seen as the sort of physical and sexual property of, of their masters um, but um, I think the other argument they make against marriage under its current conditions is that it corrupts, that the unequal relationships between men and women corrupt the institution of marriage and therefore kind of corrupt the family and corrupt society. They say the equality of married persons before the law is not only the sole mode in which that particular relation can be made consistent with justice to both sides oh sorry there's a bit of a typo there it should be sides not aids and conducive to the happiness of both but it is the only means of rendering the daily life of mankind in any high sense a school of moral cultivation and both and just to pause there to explain the moral cultivation Taylor and Mill were really concern and this comes through in in their work on utilitarianism for the moral improvement that that the purpose of being alive is to become a better person to become the best version of yourself that you can become and that society's aim is progress for them is better moral cultivation but their morality is not necessarily the christian morality of custom and Mill um, argues that he was not just made, became an atheist, he was raised an atheist. Their uh, morality is the morality of equality between all human beings. And I think this is, again, where we might go back to seeing this as a kind of a, a, a socialist ideal, that there is no class, um, but they don't see class in a Marxist terms. Though the truth may not be felt or generally acknowledged for generations to come, the only school of genuine moral sentiment is society between equals. The moral education of mankind has hitherto emanated chiefly from the law of force and is adapted almost solely to the relations which force creates. And then they go on to talk about the fact that um, the, the corruption of the mastery of men over women is that any man can be master over any woman, no matter what kind of moral character he has. Again, some of this language is a little bit kind of alien and um, distasteful to us, but I mean, I think they're really talking about being good citizens, acting well by your fellow human beings, um, they're saying that unless there's equality between men and women, no other equality or moral good or progress can actually happen. And that in the family, this becomes really important. So I'm going to pause there. I mean, that that's the extract I pulled out from the um, women and work opening paragraph. I'm going to kind of pause there and have a look at the chat again and see if there's any um, big questions that, that come up. I mean, I think that um, what I'm seeing in the chat are the huge questions that, that come out of um, discussing this work. Um, I would sort of, you know- Kate, can, have, Kate, yeah. can I yeah. ask a question? Yeah, sure. Which is, um, this is just unbelievably brilliant, what, um, uh, has been, what Harriet Mill wrote. Um, it, what, who read it? Like, could you tell us, like you keep saying, okay, so Marx came afterwards. Is there any evidence that Marx read it? Did Pankhurst uh, read right, it? Yeah. Did Vic Queen Victoria read it? Like, oh, or did yes. they just pretend she hadn't, like, that like, can sort of silence her straight away? Well, um, I think people read this and I think they read it as John Stuart Mill rather than Harriet Taylor, that because her name was not on it. 
and um, uh, uh, unfortunately, and I think it's the work of second wave feminists that has made Harriet Taylor. I mean, you know, that's interesting because we use Harriet Taylor, but that's her married name from her first marriage. Um, you know, then the question who we what name we give her is a really interesting one. So uh, I think that it's the work of second wave feminists who've made Harriet visible. Um, but people certainly read Subjection of Women. Not sure that Queen Victoria would have read it. Um, I'm not sure about Marx, but Engels may well have read it because he's the one, you know, in the Marx and Engels collaboration, he's the one that writes that essay on the family. I mean, and, I, and that's interesting. I mean, just to, to sort of a sideline about um, Marx and Engels, right? We accept, we talk about Marx and Engels. We accept that that was a collaborative writing relationship and that the ideas come from Marx and Engels, you know, and we can identify, well, Marx wrote Capital, but he was working with Engels. I think we need to talk about Taylor and Mill, you know, that or the Mills, if you want to sort of say, OK, you know, that they 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 were a collaborative writing um, activists. Yeah, their writing was their activism, I suppose. I mean, I um, think I think that the reason Engels is not nearly as famous as Marx, I mean, apart from that he didn't write as much, is because of what he wrote about women. That's, I mean, yeah. I'm deeply cynical about it. So I think that they've tried to, loads of people haven't really heard of him or read what, it's because he actually acknowledges women, whereas Marx pretty much sidelines us completely and makes a, an argument which has completely devastated our struggle. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yes. And Marx could so easily, which Engels is moving towards, is the what is it? It came up in um, one of these webinars a couple of weeks ago about the um, the kind of spare pool of labor. It's got a proper name. I should know oh, it. Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 It's but not the lump and proletariat, is it? No, it's, the, it's, yeah, I know, it's yeah. that women operate as this spare pool of labor yeah. that you can bring in when you need to. You know, I mean, during the First and Second World Wars, for example. Um, and I think Engels starts to get us towards recognizing that idea. Um, so people, I mean, the, the, John Stuart Mill himself, I mean, I don't think men can be feminists, but I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a, I have to say, uh, a bit of a fangirl of John Stuart Mill himself, partly because he gives all the credit to Harriet and no one listens. But he was a member of parliament for a while. And one of his first... Um, his first speech, his maiden speech, oh, I hate that word. His first speech in Parliament was for the enfranchisement of women. And his his bill, you know how uh, members of Parliament can bring forward private members' bills. His private members' bill was a petition for the enfranchisement of women. So he was so public about this issue. And when you start, if you read the subjection first and then read utilitarianism on liberty and representative government you see it it's threaded through all of those texts and now I've started to really look at Harriet I'm kind of going oh she's in all those texts as well and you know uh, it, it's interesting to think about and I'm not the only I'm not the first I mean I'm riding on the shoulders of some giant feminist scholars who've done this work before me um uh, but, you know, we should talk about the mills really rather than and not mean his father, you know, but but to talk about Harriet and John together, I think. But we should read these essays. Um, I noticed in the chat someone saying they're so angry that this was not part of their education. This is why um, I uh, I teach this material um, in the face of all that we're facing at the moment, you know. Uh, well, because I think. Yeah. We've come to we've come to eleven o'clock, so um, we're going to have to um, call it a day. Um, on behalf of everybody here in this webinar, I'd like to just say this is unbelievably brilliant. It was absolutely oh, fantastic. Thank you so much. It's just I'm going to put I'm going to put a spotlight on me so I can sort of say thank you on everybody's behalf. It's well, fantastic. You. We've been doing these radical feminist perspectives, so I think it's about two years now, and. When we started, we thought, well, we've got about two things that we can do and then we might run out and look what's happened. <laughs> this is like a whole massive new area. So I'm sure that everybody wants you to come back uh, really often <laughs> because there's so much more <laughs> that you know. Oh, and dear, to share. So, yeah, yeah. Well, that's very kind. Thank you for asking me. It, 
And it's just stunning. I mean, I feel like quoting now, just cutting and pasting all this Harriet Mill, Taylor Mill stuff with pictures of her making memes and sending it around. It's just, <laughs> just a joy. Thank you so much. And um, Kate's going to come to the breakout rooms. She's just going to come and do a very quick debrief with me where I'm going to try and get her to put her name on a date on quite a lot more of these. <laughs> and that's why you have to come to the debrief and then see, see you in the breakout rooms. Okay. Hopefully. Well, thank you, everyone, for dealing with such heavy material on a Sunday morning. <laughs> okay. Bye, -bye. Bye everybody. Bye.